Ooh, well, do an introduction. Hello everyone and welcome to the first lecture of MIT's IAP radio series. Um, we have Phil Erickson here who's going to sort of give an introduction to basically everything radio. And if you want to see more, there will be more lectures through IAP. You can find them either in the emails we've sent out or on MIT's IAP guide. Thank you. Great. You're a very trusting audience. You haven't heard me say anything yet. Um, <laughs> now, it's very, very nice to be here. And um, uh, like Daniel said, uh, this is a series of lectures that is essentially intended, because it's an IAP period, to provide some sort of useful information, hopefully introduce you to subjects and some science and some other things that you may not have necessarily thought about before having to do with radio in some form or another. So my job tonight is to give you a very brief overview of kind of radio in its, its skeletal form, kind of like the high level. I will try to point out as I go some links to places where you're going to see lectures that are a little more specific by other people in the series later. Um, and uh, by the way, so my name is Phil Erickson. I'm an assistant director at a place called MIT Haystack Observatory, which is run by MIT but is not on campus. It's out in Westford, Massachusetts. It's about 40-something kilometers away from us now to the northwest, long 495. It's where I spend most of my time. However, um, walking to this uh, lecture hall, I passed Maria Zuber, who's the vice president for research, for whom I work. So uh, in some sense, this hallway is a little familiar from that point of view. Um, so I do research. I do not teach. Uh, we are 100% uh, scientific research. I get grants from places like NSF and NASA to do this sorts of thing. And um, so I play with radio waves. And um, so before we get started, um, this picture right here is, is uh, one of the things I want to talk about is a little bit of history of how maybe we got here. That's a particularly interesting thing. That's from an in-house pu publication at Westinghouse Corporation called the Westinghouse Engineer. And if you have good eyes, and you see down here, this is November 1946. And does anybody recognize that particular device? Turns out that's a cavity magnetron that was instrumental in World War II and all the radar development that occurred not that far from here in the radiation laboratory. This was one of the first times it had actually come out of the classified world and was being talked about as a device that was being developed to push radio from where it was up into the microwaves, in this case for a particular uh, application. Um, this is, in fact, uh, one of the first descriptions of the center reader wave magnetron, again, from all the work that occurred in the 30s and the 40s by both the British and the US. Um, and this was in actually an amateur ma magazine. This is QST, which is the publication of the American Radio Relay League, back in December 1945. And if you remember your history from 1945, this is about when things were just emerging. You know, now it can be told. And this is sort of a little bit of a discussion of the thing that is, in fact, in your microwave ovens at home uh, that heats your coffee or heats your food. Um, and so. This is a nice example of something that was historic gradually coming out into the world and becoming available. Um, we're actually going through another revolution in, in radio having to do with software-defined peripherals and little things like this that I will talk about a little bit later. Uh, but this is sort of an, uh, an example from the mid-1940s. Uh, before I start, I have to thank all of those people over there and more. Um, this is sort of a talk that stands on the shoulders of many people who came before me. Um, all the MIT Haystack Observatory staff out there in Westford, and my home club, the Neshoba Valley Amateur Radio Club, because I am a radio amateur, the American Radio Radio League, the Radio Society of Great Britain, and um, special hello to my dad, who's watching from upstate New York. Hi, dad. <laughs> and, and my 13-year-old son at home, who didn't want to make the trek because he had homework. Um, hi, folks. Um, so. This is an outline, okay? And we're going to try to get reasonably high level, but I'll try to dip in and sort of talk about some interesting things as we go. Again, the idea is to just do a broad portfolio, kind of an introduction to some of the things you have to deal with when you're dealing with radio waves to either receive information or send information, or in some cases, both. I'll start with a general radio block diagram, also then to show you where some of the other lectures in this series are going to fall. Um, a little bit of radio history, that's kind of a favorite thing of mine about how we got here. Um, a little bit of radio fundamentals, this is not 
you don't have to find your Jackson electromagnetics textbook. You know, we'll lock the door and we're going to hand out Jackson. No. Um, we're just going to show you a little bit about how, elect how electromagnetic waves behave, some of their properties. And then there's basic components of things like uh, to do with radio, like transmitters. How do you make a radio wave? How do you get it out of the electronics into the environment? An antennas or transducers. How do you get one back? How do you process them, detect them, and then extract information from them? And then at the end, I'll show you just a couple of radio science examples where you're trying to use radio itself not as a communication device, but as a science application. And again, a bit of a teaser for what's coming on a little bit later in the week. This is Haystack. For those of you who haven't been there, um, we're, again, we're out in Route 495 land. Um, here we are down in Cambridge. And if you go on to Google Earth, um, and you like to memorize place names to five digits, that's where we are according to the WGS 84 survey. We're on top of a small hill and there's a bunch of rather large antennas. This was actually a field site for MIT Lincoln Laboratory, which if you don't know was created in 1950 as the place where classified or DOD research would happen in the MIT system. Um, this was actually a field site which looks like this on um, a nice fall day you'll notice that the antennas are reasonably large. Uh, these are cars, um, and the, uh, my office is up near that ball there, which has a large 37 meter antenna in it. So we do a number of things that all have a theme of radio science. We're using radio in some way to either extract information from an object that's already emitting radio waves, or if it isn't, illuminating it with a radio wave and then seeing what comes back and figuring out some information about the object. So that would cover things like radio astronomy, which you will hear about later in this series, atmospheric science, which you will also hear about later in this series. I won't talk about space surveillance, but um, that hill was in fact founded to be the prototype for the ballistic missile early warning system from the Cold War in the 1950s. Um, that happens on the hill. Like I mentioned, we all do radio science in one form or another. Having large antennas like that with very powerful transmitters means that being in Cambridge, mm, not so much. So uh, at the time that was uh, built in 1950, uh, just to tell you, uh, well actually this, you know, we, we first broke ground in 55 or 56. Route 128 had been opened in 1950. Route 495 was still 15 or 20 years in the future. So this was a very sleepy spot. It's where people from Boston used to go to spend their summers. So not so many neighbors were up on a hill. Uh, so it was a nice place to do radio experimentation. Very, very simply, I mean about as simple as I can make it, what do we do, what kind of blocks do we play with in radio? Well, ultimately, if you were a communications person, you would like to get information from one place to another place, where you are to where you're not. And if we stick with that, you have to take that information, it might be voice, it might be data, it might be um, encrypted or not, and you have, to send, you have to basically generate a radio wave somehow, which means that you have usually an oscillator, you have a modulator which impresses the information on the oscillator in some form, and then you usually have an amplifier to get that wave up big enough so that it's gonna survive the trip from us to somewhere else. Well, that's in the electronics. You then have to go to something that actually translates an electromagnetic wave from a piece of electronics into a propagating wave out in the environment, and that's where an antenna comes in, which is really a transducer. It's, it's translating from um, you know, wires and, sol and, and uh, physical electronics to a propagating medium. So now there's a wave going that has some information imposed on it. It has to go through a medium. The medium may not do too much to it, or it may do a lot to it, depending on the frequency and how the wave is interacting with the molecules in the medium. After it goes through the medium, it's going to hit yet another transducer because I want to go back to the electronic world. And then I have to do the reverse. I have to basically detect that the wave is there. I have to demodulate it. I have to detect usually a range of frequencies around the one I sent, pull that out, and that's where my information goes. And now I've completed the loop from receiver, from a person who wanted to send information to a person who's receiving it. Now, that's an active system. If I were a radio astronomer, I hate this part. I can't stand this part, so I don't do that. The object itself emits something, like a neutron star. At that point, then it goes through the medium, which in this case is the, the interstellar medium between us and the thing, but then I do the same things over here. So it depends on your poison. If you're trying to do radio astronomy, none of this. If you're trying to do radar because the object doesn't emit anything, well, you like this. <laughs> 
So that's about as basic as I can make it. This is how the lectures coming up will fit into this diagram. Um, our, my colleagues at Case Western Reserve University, some of whom are sitting in the front row here, will do some demonstrations of, for example, how one modulates a signal and how one impresses information on it. Um, along with that, the last lecture in the series by Joel Dawson is actually talking about a cellular data application, in fact, 5G, the next wave of cellular communications. So, you know, that's going to touch the modulator part here. I'm going to talk later in the series about what happens after that thing leaves the antenna and it propagates out through the medium and what we can learn as a remote sensing uh, tool, for example, about the ionosphere. You can actually propagate radio waves through it. They don't get put through unchanged. But if I sense that, I can tell something about the medium. My colleague Anthea Koster, also from MIT Haystack, will talk about things that happen in the medium, specifically space weather. So as a sort of a, a geophysical application of looking at this particular channel. And then my uh, extremely distinguished colleague, Alan Rogers, will talk about some basics of radio astronomy, how you actually use this particular loop to detect very, very faint signals, in some cases from the primordial hydrogen uh, at the very beginnings of the universe. He's done that work. My colleague, Mary Knapp, who is a MIT PhD graduate, will talk about trying to do radio astronomy, but in space, on a space platform. Because unfortunately, at low frequencies, humans are very loud. And so if you want to go look at the sky, you have to get off planet. So she'll talk a little bit about that. And then my colleague Frank Lynn will not only talk about some of the plumbing here, in fact, in terms of software radio receivers, and I'll mention that in a moment, but he will also talk about radar principles in general. What if you have to make the wave that you're going to scatter off an object? How does that work? So this is kind of a little diagram just to, just to encourage you to come back for the other lectures. Um, there's, these are extremely accomplished people and there's a lot of really cool information in here and um, I'm going to see if I can make it myself to as many as I can even though Mary has an office across the hall from me. History, a little bit of history. I find it's always useful to know where you're coming from. We can go back to Marconi. Um, this is a plaque that the IEEE put up at, um, at one of the sites in the US that he transmitted from. He's up there. Um, there's some people kind of hauling up some antennas. This is some of his spark gap apparatus that he was using. Um, Professor Kasdan at the front here has done a lot of reading about very early radio stuff. You can quiz him about a lot of this history too after the lecture. Um, this was the kind of diagrams we're talking about in circuits. It's a little hard to see, but you know, you're, 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 you're still in the ink and pen kind of uh, stage. Very simple components. These transmitters were often very crude. They basically would just emit a spark, which meant that they would f emit a whole huge amount of radio waves kind of right across the spectrum. But nobody was really using the radio spectrum for too much at this point. And in fact, in this 12 December 1901, so we're at the very beginning of the 20th century, he managed to get from St. John's, Newfoundland over to Cornwall, England, which was quite an accomplishment because radio waves at that time were thought to go line of sight. So how did I get? over to England from Newfoundland when I can't see England from Newfoundland. It turns out that some of it must have gone up and reflected off a conducting layer above us, which happens to be the ionosphere, and come down. He also did that to Galway, Ireland, to, as in, in a series of experiments. So very, very early stuff is stuff that would have been in the hallways down here in the first 50 years of the Institute on wooden boards, usually. Um, but very, very fundamental sort of explorations of what does this wave do? What are its properties? Can I do it? Can I use it for anything kind of quasi, quasi uh, useful? This is my hero, Edwin Howard Armstrong, another early pioneer of trying to figure out how you can modulate information, how you can get information onto a carrier wave, a wave that by itself doesn't really have a lot of information in it. Um, this is, uh, he was a, a lieutenant in World War I, also did a lot of work in World War II, and he came up with one of the very, very practical devices that allowed you to take a very, very weak radio wave from the environment and amplify it greatly above the background noise in your receiver, the concepts of regeneration and super regeneration, which was basically to get, make an amplifier with a huge amount of gain that would then pull your signal in a given frequency range out of the muck. And that, in fact, is a diagram that he's doing on the board here also of his patent of um, his regeneration um, feedback circuit. Basically, you're taking a little bit of the output of an amplifier and you're feeding it back to the input. And if you keep doing that, the amplification keeps going over and over and you can get 
you know, an amplification factor of a million rather than just a, maybe about a hundred. But you can see the circuits. We have things that would be familiar to anybody in an introductory EE course. We have coils, we have condensers or capacitors, we have a battery there, you'll see B1 and B2, and, um, you know, and, and, a, and a power supply. But that's sufficient to get an oscillating circuit going either to generate a, a, a wave that you want to send or in his case to really amplify it above the uh, noise. A lot of this stuff was published in the amateur literature. This is him describing essentially that super regenerative circuit in February 1920. He was the president of the Radio Club of America and he did that in an amateur magazine. So at the time, these magazines were in fact, you know, a lot of this work didn't go in referee journals. They were, do, they were people who were playing around, having fun, and exploring the space, if you want to think about it that way. Um, so a lot of this work happened in, in laboratories at Columbia University. This was his laboratory. Notice it's in the philosophy building at Columbia University. Very classic wooden benches. You will see galvanometers here to measure various voltages. You will see vacuum tubes, the amplification device of the day. Um, and there's the audio amplifier over there um, with Nipper, the RCA dog, poking out of it. Um, one of the other things that Armstrong did, in fact, was basically come up with FM radio, frequency modulation radio, which if you ever read about it is a very interesting subject because it was considered to be theoretically not what you should do. He deliberately transmitted more frequencies instead of less frequencies. And people f knew that if you transmitted more frequencies around the center, you let in more noise. So why would I transmit more? Well, it turned out that he had managed to figure out that nature, nature natural noise is one flavor, and you can transmit no uh, your signal of another flavor, and magically all the noise goes away. And he did that. He was the one that sort of pushed that in the late early 1930s. And then promptly when World War II broke out, he gave all the patents to the U.S. government free for the duration of the war. And in fact, most of the signal cores radios were based on FM. Um, so he was, a, he was sort of an open source fellow, if you want to think about it that way. But you can see what he was working with. Again, point to point wiring, very simple stuff. Um, he was also a bit of a uh, iconoclast. This is a picture of him climbing up the, t the top of WJZ in New York City. Um, he loved to do this. He had no fear of heights at all. This is on top of a multi-story building in New York City. And there he is up there with his foot stuck in there. And here he is at the ball at the top of the tower. He used to have these pictures taken and sent to David Sarnoff at RCA, for whom he worked. And David would just get enraged and go ballistic because he says, you fool, you're going to fall off there. Um, so in addition to having fun, you do have as is usual in scientific stuff, you have iconoclasts all over the place who happen to have a lot of fun at the same time that they're doing this work. Um, I highly recommend this book. If you're looking for a good book, because it turns out like anything that involves humans, there's not only technology, but there's a lot of personality and battles that occurred in the early radio uh, development. This is from Tom Lewis, who's a history professor at Skidmore College at the time in 1991. It's called Empire of the Air. This you'll get interesting stories in this book. This is the tower that Edwin Armstrong constructed himself on his hill in New Jersey, next to his house. That's about 200 and something feet. He used to haul himself up with a chair. And when, if you read the book, you will find out why he would haul himself up to the top of that and put a little flag out with his patent number, which was then readable with binoculars from David Sarnoff's office in Rockefeller Center in New York City. <laughs> Lots of interesting stuff in here. Um, you'll f the early development of television, which used FM sound as its analog sound uh, reproduction. That's Armstrong in there. So I, I highly recommend that book. It's really, really good. So then radio came out of the experimental lab and got to the point where you, know, you had people who were basically wanted to use it as a commercial device to, again, transmit information. And so, for example, here's KDKA in Pittsburgh the first commercial radio broadcast back in November 1920 with a 200-watt transmitter. Not too much. Um, there they are doing their thing. Um, in those days, tape recorders really didn't come along for commercial broadcast until the late 30s and early 1940s. So um, all the programs were live to air. So all these radio stations had full symphony orchestras that were dedicated to the station that would play a classical concert for 15 minutes. 
for example. Um, you had people who were doing live radio announcing, again, no tape recorders. This guy was the fellow who announced the Harding-Cox presidential election. That's Warren G. Harding. I don't remember what Cox's first name was. Um, but radio has now moved into sort of a broadcast medium. Okay, so now we're doing communications of news and entertainment to, to various folks. And um, this kept going um, with radios like this one, this fancy console radio. This is a Zenith 10S 464 from about 1940. These were in prominent places in people's living rooms. Um, if you were an amateur, you would have a shed in the back or something like that where you would continue to experiment. This is a little uh, sheet from, um, I think, Life magazine back in the 1940s. Commercial broadcasting was the way that people got entertainment. This was so important that in the 1930 census, one of the questions they asked everybody was, do you have a radio in the house? They considered that that was an important indication of how well the community, the broadcast medium was reaching out to people. So until pretty much television supplanted this as a primary medium, this was your entertainment. I mean, you know, you, you had your radio schedule on the wall, and if you wanted to listen to your soap operas in the day, if you happened to be home, or these radio programs in the evening, radio waves were the medium that, it, that got them from a lot, but it's one to many, broadcast, large transmitter, out to many listeners at the same time. This is an example of the gear as we now move forward to the 1950s. This is the receiver that I first started playing with when I was smaller. Um, I'm, I'm not, I don't go back to the purely vacuum tube era, but this happened to be the one that I played with. This is a National NC125. National was a Massachusetts company. Um, this cost about $1,400 in today's cost. This was about $150 in 1952. This is what happens if you lift the lid. Those days, the amplifications were vacuum tubes, which British people called valves. Um, they were essentially a way to modulate a power supply and extract energy from the power supply with an incoming wave through, say, a grid or a, or a triode or a pentode. And uh, they provided the essential functions for doing radio. How do you detect the wave? How do you mix it from the frequency it is down to a frequency you can handle? Um, how do you then, say, extract the audio out of it and amplify it? And you'll notice all the mechanical tuned circuits in here. These are dial strings that you would literally mechanically move back and forth, and they would turn these ganged capacitors, which are just plates that come in and out and change the capacitance. Um, so this is the way that radio was done up until actually not really that, that long ago. You know, uh, solid state transmitters and receivers even hit the amateur market in the you know, late 50s, early 60s. But you, know, you, were, you were still doing a lot of this. I'll just mention a couple of things, and it turns out that the people who fooled around with these amateur radio stuff actually went on to do some interesting things. Um, Tom Clark up there um, went on to do very long baseline interferometry using radio waves from two antennas the size of the planet to do very fine scale um, imaging of distant objects, um, a lot of satellite work. This is Owen Garriott. If you go to the National Air and Space Museum, I don't know if you can right now, but if the government <laughs> comes back online and you go there, they have a space lab exhibit in the middle. It's a three-story thing. It's, the, it's a chunk from one of the Apollo, Soyuz, uh, Apollo unused stages. If you go in there, you'll see a picture of Owen Garriott. Um, he basically was on something called Space Lab. He was also up in the um, Apollo Soyuz mission, which was putting a sta space station up there. He actually was the first person who did an amateur radio transmission from, from Earth orbit. He did it during his spare time on a shuttle flight. He basically put a radio in one of the things and came along. Um, he was actually proposed this doing, doing this earlier during the exhibit that you'll see in the, in the Smithsonian and Skylab 3, which was July 1973. Skylab is what they did with all the, the three Apollo missions they didn't send to the moon. They broke them up and one of the things they did was put them into orbit as an, as an orbiting laboratory. Um, you can continue on to this fellow who started in his, his shed tinkering with things and ended up inventing the radio transceiver, the telephone pager, and the cordless telephone. Um, George Jacobs there developed Oscar I, which was one of the first amateur radio satellites, in his garage. Okay, He was literally building it on a wooden bench in his garage, um, which was launched you know, in the early 60s. He also happened to develop the Voice of America shortwave broadcasting system. So, this continues. Those of you who use TCP IP on your laptops, there's a little delay parameter in there. Well, it turns out that if you try to go from ground to space, the delay parameter wasn't big enough. 
and the packets would time out. So CARM figured out how to extend that and basically then got wireless communications going back and forth to satellite platforms by hacking the TCP IP stack. Um, this is John Krause, who is a radio astronomy pioneer. Alan may talk about him a little bit. And this is the wow signal, which some people claim was a uh, extraterrestrial signal. You can see what he had to work with, basically printouts on a fan fold printer, but that's okay. Um, he, he operated the Big Ear, which was a radio observatory in Ohio. So people who played with this radio wave stuff went on to actually do some quite interesting things. So you can see how things are developing. It develops in a commercial sense, broadcasting, and then it develops in there. There's still people who are tinkering away with things. Um, and you can go to extremes. Some of you may have found the, followed the New Horizons path uh, by the Kuiper Belt object, um, uh, MU69, which is another word also called Ultima Thule. Um, there's the spacecraft. Its journey from Earth to the pass of the uh, Kuiper Belt object. That's the spacecraft. So the information gets from that spacecraft to us at an X-band transmission of about 8.4 gigahertz with 12 watts of power in that little 2.1 meter antenna. So that's about, you know, tall as me. And it's a six hour one-way propagation time that's 6.4 billion kilometers at distance. And if you have a large enough antenna listening on the ground, this is the NASA 70 meter deep space network uh, out in Goldstone, California, you can still get one kilobit per second over that distance. However, if you fill your hard drive on the spacecraft with information, it does take you 20 months to download all the science packets. So we're going to be seeing stuff emerge from the next two years. By the way, this is the latest image. Um, I guess Kuiper Belt objects apparently are lumpy. Um, there's some speculation about how these things must have come together very, very slowly to retain the two lobed structure. Um, by the way, this is the signal that is received when we transmit from here to New Horizons to give it a command. It's about a femtowatt. But the signal doesn't matter. It really matters what the noise floor is that you're trying to deal with. And it turns out that that is sufficient to actually get commands up to that spacecraft and to have it send its one kilobit per second signal. Without radio waves, you're not doing this. So you can turn the knob up. And, and the nice thing about this is this is classical physics, so it scales. Another application which my colleague Frank Lynn will talk a lot about in one of the, pre the, the subsequent <laughs> lectures is radar and MIT. I, you know, I'm kind of privileged to be right close to where most of it happened. Uh, the radiation laboratory, that's radio detection and ranging. This is what happens when the object doesn't give off a radio signal and you'd like to know something about the object. How far away is it? How big is it? What is its effective size? How fast is it going? And maybe even is, is it round, uh, cylindrical? Does it have things sticking out of it? Um, these are courtesy of my colleagues at Lincoln Laboratory, so that's a man-made object. Um, you can also use radar on, on geophysical objects or, or uh, other things in the near Earth space environment. You transmit a pulse, it goes from you to that, that thing scatters some of the energy, and that reflected pulse comes back and in a classical sort of monostatic configuration, you receive it with an antenna, and then you process to extract some information about the target by comparing the wave you sent out with the wave you got back. Why radar? I like these two cartoons. Um, this is someone saying, you know, hey Fred, you're looking in the wrong place. Optical systems are wonderful, but they tend to be fairly narrow field. And so it's a little hard to do really interesting surveys or find things with that. These are real. This is what people used to do before, for example, radars to look at objects. Those are horns. And that is a fellow sitting there with two tubes in his ears. Um, they basically just plumbed all the horns together and he would do things like listen for the propellers of aircraft over the wind, which gets you out about 15 kilometers and then you can't hear them anymore. In World War I, they used to do that with Zeppelins, because Zeppelins were reasonably slow. So you could sit there and sit and listen for a while. Obviously, this doesn't work if the wind comes up, if it's cloudy or something else, it doesn't work that well either. So it's nice to have a, way, a, a electromagnetic way to do, the, to do this sort of remote detection. Um, and that's where I mentioned the, la the, uh, the radiation laboratory. You can read about the Tizard mission in 1940. This was extremely classified. This basically was the British sharing a lot of early microwave development they had done with the radiation laboratory here. And there's what the radiation laboratory used to look like. 
you can try to identify the footprints of the building that we now have here. Um, and they developed about 100 radars during the course of the war at a cost of about a billion dollars at the time. 4,000 employees, nine Nobel Prizes came out of it. And other things like the laser, radio astronomy, and the transistor kind of fell out of the mix. So, um, and there's that cavity magnetron again. If you happen to take apart your microwave oven, your inexpensive microwave oven, you'll find one of those in there. It's essentially just a uh, multi-cavity amplification device for microwaves. Um, and then people worked on that to get it small enough to put it on an aircraft. So radar was quite an important, again, application of radio waves. In this case, is a remote sensing tool. So just a little bit now about the thing, about the properties of the radio waves that we're using, which really are just a form of electromagnetic waves, the same ones at a different frequency that you're using to see me, for example. Um, it starts here. This is the rule book, at least for classical physics. Um, there's Maxwell up at the top, who in fact unified this particular series of equations by taking things that had been, been discovered in the laboratory by Gauss and um, Ampere, for example, added one in, in himself. He realized that uh, if, he, if he had a magnetic field and he changed it as a function of time, he generated a rotational electric field around it. And then the real key, the real key thing was these, these equations without this term are not closed. You can't make a second order differential equation out of them and then come up with a propagating wave um, as a solution to that second order differential equation, except for this, which is the displacement current. And that's sort of Maxwell's one of, I considered probably, you know, one of the greatest things he, con he contributed here was to realize that there, in fact, is a term here that happens even <laughs> across things like capacitor plates. And again, because of our location, I had to put this fellow up. Um, I like the first quote, which basically says, you know, you have to have some deep understanding of mathematics to really explain the beauties of these things. And he, he says, I'm sorry, but this seems to be the case. I must have been a more general lecture. I like this one because, honestly, this is magic. Right? If I tell you that I, I take a charge and I wiggle it and somewhere a thousand kilometers away somebody knows that I wiggled it or that I put my hand up and a radio photon went through my hand that was generated a millisecond after the universe was created and that I can tell something about it, that's just act honestly magic. Okay? We know these equations work because of countless numbers of people who have tested them in all sorts of, of places there's still a fundamental mystery there, which is kind of, for me, what makes the whole thing interesting. But as Feynman says here, if you take away the scaffolding that's used to build this, if you take away your, your understanding or your constructs of what's going on, the edifice stands on its own. So although we may not understand exactly what, how that building was constructed, we can nevertheless stand back and say that's a really cool building. So, that's the wonderful thing about uh, classical electromagnetics is that there's a there there's the rule book folks you know if you can understand this in most conditions with boundary conditions don't have you this is how things propagate in an electromagnetic sense and as Dick Feynman says we don't have to necessarily understand it all the way down to appreciate it and use it This is, this is not going to, this is uh, not going to be used to anybody here. So waves have certain properties that we can use from an electromagnetic standpoint. There is this relationship between frequency and wavelength, which happens to be, let's never mind the relativistic correction right now, the speed of light. And so, you know, typical radio stuff is dealing with wavelengths of hundreds of meters to meters to centimeters to even millimeters these days. Um, but there's, a, there's this relationship between frequency and wavelength for a far field propagating electromagnetic wave. Um, a wave has an amplitude and a phase. One can use both of those in radio because the, the radio photon is quite small. Optical systems, it's a little more hard to deal with phase, but we have a nice set of detectors that can detect both amplitude and phase. Um, we, have, we can use constructive and destructive addition. So we can tell how coherent two waves are that are combining to see the thing we see, or how noise-like they are, and that tells us something about the thing that is emitting the radio wave. This might be a, this might be a radio astronomy 
um, for example, a application. This might be a communication signal. So we can use those properties. We can use the fact that the waves are polarized. They have both an electric and magnetic fields that are at right angles, in this case, to their propagation direction. And so a, a, a wave can have a vertical polarization or a horizontal polarization, and that itself encodes information. So there's lots of different dimensions to these waves that we can use either as a vehicle to get our information from A to B or to extract some information about the object that's emitting them. And then there's the whole Doppler effect, um, which in itself can tell me something about the line of sight motion of the object, for example, that's scattering a wave uh, from on its way from transmitter to receiver. Another thing that we can use fundamentally and obviously at the core of any remote sensing system. So we have to make this, so let's suppose we're in a situation where the object doesn't make its own energy at radio frequencies and we have to make it. Well, there are these things called radio transmitters, and so we'll just spend a couple of minutes looking at a couple of pictures of, a, of things that make radio waves. Well, there's a real small one. That's called the Pixie. There's the, there's the diagram. There's basically two transistors in that. Um, let's see, one crystal and a little bit of a filtering network on the output, and it's $5 with shipping if you go to eBay, for example, or your local radio club and find one. And all it does is it, if you push a key down, it starts emitting what, a sine wave. And if you let the key up, it stops. So you're basically doing Morse code with that, which was one of the earliest forms of modulation. You were taking a carrier, which, was, which in mathematics you assume started at the beginning of time and ended at the end of time, and you were imposing an, an envelope on it, and that envelope has information. So for example, there's two amateurs talking back and forth on a device which may not be that dissimilar to this. It's not a very high power device, okay? It's half a watt, it runs off a battery. But no matter, um, this is information. I've now encoded information, in this case, um, in, in amplitude-wise, on a radio signal, and I'm using that to communicate with somebody else. And David's, uh, you know, is going to be talking a little bit about transmitters because because they're going to be doing demonstrations with modulation. So the crew at Case Western will let you play with that a little bit. Then there's not so small transmitters like the ones I have. Um, you can keep going, and in fact, if you are at microwaves, these are tuned UHF um, cavity amplifiers. These are four cavity tuned amplifiers. You have an electron beam down here. You have a big filament. You make the bottom of this tube 90 kilovolts negative, and you ground the top. And the electrons come flying out of the gun, and they go through that cavity. And every time they see, they, there's a tube, evacuated tube in the center. And every time they see a resonant cavity, tuned to the frequency I want to transmit, they stop being linear and they start being bunched. And every time they bunch, you're basically pulling information out, the power out of that power supply, you inject the wave you want to send, and by the time that, that modulated electron beam gets to about to the top, you can extract the power out, and you have about a 30 dB amplifier. So that one, if you put about 500 watts in, you get 1.25 megawatts out. These were developed for the ballistic missile early warning system. Um, I used one of them and I used one of them yesterday in the socket. We run two of these in parallel. So we run about a two and a half megawatt <laughs> transmitter at UHF frequencies, but it's pulsed. We don't leave it on all the time. It's only on for a little bit. And then we let that pulse go up and in our case into the atmosphere and feel it's coming back. But transmitters can be small or big. Transmitters also come in two types. One of them is a single place where you do all of the amplification in one place. That's like that tube. Another one is where you have very many small amplifiers, each emitting its own little radio signal, and you let the energy assembly happen coherently in one direction in free space. That's something called a phased array. So for example, that has, this has the same transmit power as two of these, but there's 4,096 little transmitters that are all coherently phased, so that in the direction you want to look at, all that power adds up. So transmitters do come in sort of varieties, either one big one or many small ones. Just another picture of the transmitters that we use. Um, when you use single uh, transmitters, unfortunately because you have electrons that are going at a reasonable fraction of the speed of light and then suddenly have to stop at the top of the tube when they hit the plate that's grounded, um, they generate a lot of x-rays. So they have to be in a lead-lined box. So we get to deal with that. You also get to deal with the fact that it's not 
exactly going to be, you're not going to walk up with your patch cord and go 90 kilovolts on the bottom of the tube and then take 90 kilovolts off. You need a switch. That's our switch, which is basically two hospital x-ray tubes that are used as high current switches. This is the on and this is the off. And you can't just turn the thing on and off in air because air breaks down at 7 kilovolts per inch. So if you just did that in air, with, if there's ground anywhere within about a foot, it, you get lightning bolts. So uh, this is in a 5,000 gallon dielectric oil tank where all of the bus connections are made. So if you do all the amplifying in one place, you get these sort of problems. But on the other hand, it's a very efficient amplifier if you can solve all of these other headaches. These are operational. They were used both for radar applications. They're now being used for scientific purposes. So transmitters, again, come in many flavors, big or small. Now I've got to get this stuff out into the environment. That's where the transducer comes, or another, in, in, in other words, the radio antenna. And they come in many flavors as well. You have to have an efficient way to get the electromagnetic wave out of the gear you've got, and then out in, as a propagating wave into the environment. We have a biological electromagnetic transducer, which is receive only. Um, Borg notwithstanding, um, at about 300 to 700 nanometer wavelength, much shorter wavelength than the radio waves I deal with, um, and there it is. We've evolved to have a, a um, transmitter that looks like that with a retina that then is the detector. Well, this is what it looks like in an electromagnetic sense. You're bit, that's one at one meter wavelength, so that's about 300 megahertz. Um, that will transmit and receive, in, in our case, it's reciprocal. If you learn about antennas, you learn that things go the same both ways. They're a key radio component as a transducer. Get the stuff out into the environment, and they get the stuff from the environment back to where you'd like to detect, detect them. And if you go through electromagnetics, anything where you've got a time-varying signal applied across the antenna terminals will essentially launch an electromagnetic wave, okay? And some of them do it more efficiently, and some of them do it less efficiently, depending on the wavelength or the frequency that you're exciting compared to the dimensions of the object. And there are whole courses on antenna design, but assuming you have a reasonably efficient one, you end up launching a wave with an electric field and a magnetic field going along. It, does, it, it interacts with an object. And then because of the reciprocal theory, you could use another antenna on the back, which uh, will then receive that. There's your transducer in and out. Antennas don't transmit information all in the, uh, they're not, the ideal antenna is an isotropic one that responds equally to uh, uh, signals in all directions. We typically don't use that. It's an ideal construct, and we often like to have antennas that have gain, where they basically have a lot of, they essentially, their radiation pattern is very, very focused in a particular direction, and the, the laws of essentially physical optics sort of translate to the electromagnetic domain with larger wavelengths. You will end up getting things that define what your beam looks like. Okay, um, and so typical, you'll see a lot of typical larger antennas are parabolic in nature, in fact. Um, and this is a mechanical a antenna, and the reason that they focus is that at bore sight in the middle, you can work out the fact that there's a plane where all of those paths have the same length or the same delay. So a radio wave either emitted here will have all of, those, uh, all of those different geometric paths end up with a wave that comes out in phase, and so you get a nice focused be and, and, uh, wave in the direction you'd like, and that works in reverse. And so the parabolic reflector is almost one of the more common ones that you might see if you, you look for higher and higher gain systems. And we have some of them up here, like that one and that one and that one, and the one in that particular uh, radome, which is just to protect it from the weather, which is 37 meters in diameter. Um, these are the two antennas that I use in, the, in, our, in my particular National Science, Founded, uh, Science Foundation funded, um, essentially, geospace radar. This looks at the nearer space environment. There's a para parabola, which is about 40, um, it's about 46 meters in diameter. This is a 68 meter antenna that doesn't move, it just points straight up. And the gain of an antenna is related to the, think about visually the number of wavelengths you can pack across the particular uh, you know, reflector in both dimensions. And since my, I use a wave that's 70 centimeters long, there's a lot of 70 centimeters this way and this way, 
So I have a gain of about thirty or 40,000 in the particular direction I'm looking as opposed to other directions. So it's got a reasonable amount of way to concentrate the power energy density that I uh, would like. <coughs> now these are my antennas, okay. You can get more extreme. This is the Arecibo Radio Telescope in Puerto Rico, which if you were coming in from the outer planets and you had an eye that was tuned to 440 megahertz, when that is on as a radar, that is the brightest spot on the planet by far. Um, that is not quite a parabola, it's a sphere. A uh, sphere focuses to a line, not a point, and that's actually so that you could move the beam by moving the, reflect, moving the collection point instead of having to tilt the whole reflector, because that's a 305 meter parabola, and it's in a crater and tilting the whole reflector back and forth, as you might have seen with normal par parabolic antennas, is a little difficult. Uh, the platform is about 700 tons and is su suspended by 18 cables, which you can see right here. Um, and then they hang the feeds at the focal point. Um, so this was dedicated in 1963 uh, to do both atmospheric science and radio astronomy. It spends about 90% of its life right now doing radio astronomy, but someone else built a larger one. This is the FAST telescope in China. This has been observing since late 2016. That's 500 meters in diameter. As far as I can tell, because 500 is bigger than 300. Um, it is also a spherical aperture, but they actually, from a technology point of view, do this completely differently than Arecibo does. By the way, it's up to seven Arecibos in size. But they don't use all of it at once. They actually use an Arecibo-sized spot. And then if they want to move the beam around, they can move that thing along a track and they can actually use different parts of the reflector. It's still a sphere. Now, a sphere has spherical aberration, because if you think about it, the edges of the, the, the antenna are focusing with a different length than the parts right down here. So Arecibo has basically an RF corrective lens. It has a delay line that actually makes sure that everything adds up. The fellow who designed this in China wanted to do it a little differently. He actually designs mechanical actuators that pull the antenna down to a, para to a parabolic shape. So they take 300 meters of the antenna and they yank it down to form a parabola. And if they want to look somewhere else, they let it go. It's supposed to spring back. It's supposed to. Um, I'm not sure it does. Um, and then they move to another spot. That's because the guy who designed this was partially a mechanical engineer. Um, <laughs> and likes mechanical and engineering things. Um, and in fact, the deflection, by the way, that they need is 47 centimeters. Um, so there are even at the world's largest single antenna, there are more than one way to skin a cat when it comes to antennas. <coughs> and you can keep turning up the knob. I mentioned phased arrays, that's where you have not just one collecting surface, but a whole bunch of different antennas and if you phase them up coherently, it's kind of like having, all, having a virtual surface that you build in the computer. Um, these have been used for about 40 years for doing um, things because if I want to steer the beam in a different direction, all I do is I change the electronic phasing. So instead of having to be able to mechanic having to mechanically move the beam, I can electronically steer it, which is very attractive. So you'll find phased arrays in many places, and they actually go way back. This is the Hikamarca ionospheric radar. This is in uh, the foothills of the Andes Mountains near Lima, Peru, about 100 kilometers. Um, Actually, not west of Lima, that would be in the ocean. Um, pardon me, that's east. That's 18,432 phase dipoles at 50 megahertz or 6 meters frequency. So each one of these guys is a half wave dipole, so that's 3 meters or about 10 feet from there to there. They're all on wooden posts, they're dual polarization, and this is all st steered by electronic phasing. So even back in the 50s, one knew that you could do this. Um, in, the, in Europe, we will have a, another geospace remote sensing radar that's about that size, but with fully electronic steering down the element level at something called ISCAT 3D. That's in the um, northern Scandinavia. That first light will be about the 2020s. This is an artist's concept of what it will look like. Um, so people are, are still innovating even at this larger array concept, again, in the antenna performance. Now there's receivers. What do you need to do? Well, if this is zero frequency, and I assume this is a frequency axis, 
The thing that you want, for example, is the information content that's in a little range of frequencies, in this case around some sensor frequency, which I'll call FRF. You'd like this, but you don't want these things. These are somebody else's signal, which for me is noise, and I'd like to get rid of that. So in a receiver, I'd need to, for example, amplify this signal, compensate for any losses that happen in transmission, which sometimes can be many orders of magnitude. Um, I'd like to be selective. I'd like to take only the green and leave out the, the red and the orange, for example. I'd like to be able to tune my little window back and forth if I decide that I want a different frequency or if the target changed its frequency. And then I'd also be able to like to basically shift this down to a lower frequency so that I can actually in, uh, extract the information about what the signal is and what the, for example, the object emitting it is doing. So these days, receivers have, uh, have evolved as we've gone up in frequencies. For example, that's a low noise amplifier at about the one to two gigahertz band or the L, or L band. You can see the microwave devices up there and the surface mount devices and the in and the out. There's the circuit. You also need a mixer. Mixer is a nonlinear device that, move, that basically takes a signal at some center frequency. You inject the signal at a frequency that you can tune, and then the result is the sum and the difference. And if you filter out the, the, the sum, you get something where you move the signal from a higher frequency to a lower frequency. And this is in the block diagrams of all those heterodyne receivers that, for example, Edwin Armstrong worked with. But this is a typical sort of what you might buy if you go to a mini circuits catalog and sort of go and say, I, I'd like a microwave device that does mixing. You also need filters. Filters are the thing that get rid of those little side bands and keep the green in the center. So for example, that, that, that's a bandpass filter. Keep some in a window and let go everything else. Um, and then you also need oscillators either to make the signal that you're going to end up modulating or to use as a mixed frequency. And you can be simple about your voltage controlled oscillator or very fancy if you want one that's got really pure characteristics. But So we're talking about amplifiers, mixers, filters, oscillators. You have to detect. We want to then, uh, one of the easiest ways to extract information, of course, is to use a diode, which basically takes a waveform that's going between plus and minus zero, clips off the zeros because the diode only conducts in the forward direction, and you end up getting something that's a rectified waveform. If you then put that into a capacitor, which smooths it out, you can end up getting the modulation envelope, and you can actually pull out the information around the carrier. These days, you use analog to digital interfaces typically and try to get things into the digital world because, di because filters built in the digital domain don't drift with temperature and do all sorts of the wonderful stuff that sometimes gives you headaches if you try to do it in the analog dom domain. And so analog to digital interfaces are another key part of what's going on. And architectures, there are different architectures. Direct conversion is where you take the signal and you basically go straight on down to, to center it at zero frequency and then you just record with, for example, an audio recorder. Heterodyne is where you don't go to, to zero, you go to near DC. So you may move it down to a very low frequency, low enough that, for example, you could put it into a speaker and detect that somebody is transmitting or not transmitting, and that's how Morse detectors are used typically for doing CW reception, like I showed you a little bit earlier. Dominant architecture is the super heterodyne. That's what Edwin Armstrong, and I should mention Lucien Levy here because he was another person in France that came up with this concept about the same time. You take the signal, and after you throw away most of the signals around this frequency that you want and amplify it, you move it down to a fixed frequency, always the same. And that way you can build a very, very nice filter once instead of having to build a separate filter every time I want to tune to a different frequency. The only thing you're tuning is that particular oscillator. So that radio that I showed you that I have at home that has all those mechanical components, it's making a tuned oscillator that moves back and forth, and then the rest of the circuitry can just be at the same, at the same frequency. This super heterodyne is all over the place, and um, in fact, then you get to try to extract the information out of what was happening. I showed you a very simple one here, which is that little diode. That's about as simple as we get for extracting information. These days, and this is the disruptive thing, is that you can get things that were considered pretty much unobtainable in the laboratory for uh, chips price, as they would say in, in the UK. Um, you can get little Silicon Labs SI5351 amplifiers, I mean oscillators, that are fairly pure for about eight bucks. That's with shipping. 
Um, you can get a GPS disciplined oscillator, which has a pretty, that this is good to a part per billion or more for about 150 uh, pounds, so about a couple hundred bucks. Um, there are disruptive things that allow you guys to actually play with radio waves in a way that would have taken you a lot more time and a lot more money and a lot more fiddling beforehand. Um, and there's, there's also software like this Edis USRP device that actually then gets you into the digital world where you can put together blocks that basically construct a radio out of um, essentially a plumbing diagram that's in software now. For example, this particular plumbing diagram, don't try to read it, it's an eye chart, um, that's a that's a upper sideband um, recorder, uh, that's an upper sideband receiver. That basically decodes a particular modulation form that's used a lot by amateur radio people. So one day we called our friend SM4IVE, he was an amateur in Sweden, who built this 13 meter antenna himself from bar stock <laughs> in his garage with a welder and a couple of help friends to help him put it on the stand. We pointed at the moon, he pointed at the moon, and he transmitted, the signal went 400,000 kilometers, came back to our antenna, and the very nice thing about that is that when he did that, done on my laptop, an amateur going out to the moon and back. It works. It, it, it really does. Um, the other, or you can do, for example, this. And this, is, this has got the covers taken off. This is what we call an RTL dongle. This is, uh, I think, $10 if you pay too much. Uh, eight bucks on eBay. This is a software radio. This is a tuner that goes from 50 to 1700 megahertz and an 8-bit analog to digital converter and it puts it out to the USB bus. These were made by the millions to decode digital audio broadcasts in Europe. And some person in Iceland who had a lot of time on their hands figured out that they left the engineering debug mode in here and that if you threw the right bit it would put out an IQ stream on the USB bus. I have one hooked up here to my very sophisticated antenna which I can fit in my bag and since this is recorded, I can't turn the audio on because this is WERS in Boston at 88.9 and they are playing music and music is copyrighted. <laughs> but this is, an, this is a, a waterfall, this is frequency, this is time. There's the analog FM signal coming off this $10 dongle into this little thing right here, an antenna. The nice thing about this is that you can, there's the, the, the spectrum as a function of time. So there is the analog FM signal, and then there are these two things right here that are up on the other side uh, that look very flat. If you look at right there, see they look kind of flat? That's HD radio. If anybody hears HD radio on the thing that says, you know, turn in your, turn in your old analog FM receiver and get an HD radio digital receiver, that's a pseudorandom digital bit stream right here. Um, so they're transmitting those right alongside the analog. Someday they'd like to turn off this analog and go to the digital, but they haven't gotten there yet. All of that is a software demodulator that's GQRX that's built on a GNU radio flow graph. So the nice thing is that this, it's disruptive and that people now have these tools and they can play with them. And there are GNU radio hacking conferences where people sit there and try to reverse engineer the wireless microphone and play their own music in while the guy's trying to speak. <laughs> Literally, it happens. Um, you can also do things like this. This is literally me going to a web page in the Netherlands. This is the University of Tevente in the Netherlands. In the Netherlands, this is a software receiver in the HF band, so that I don't have to drag an HF antenna with me. Hooked up to one of those dongles with a little bit of amplification, and you see that little thing I have right there that's about at 7.7075 kilohertz. So if I turn the audio on. Those are amateurs transmitting something called FT8. That's a digital mode of communication. They're using the sound card in their PC. That's a frequency shift key. There's probably about a dozen different amateurs there on 15 second cycles going back and forth. They transmit a, a very limited amount, maybe like 12 characters. The other person transmits, they go back and forth, they complete a contact and then move on. 
And you can even, if you're good, your eyes are good, you can even see the little frequency modulated tones in there. All done with software. And I could listen to that all day, but you probably do not want to. Um, so we will mute that. So are they sending it that way? Um, like, like teletype signals that they're sending? Or what? Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a very deep code. It's designed to, um, it's a very redundant code. They're basically sending the same 12 characters over and over. But there's, there's cyclic codes in there and lots of things piled on top of one another to deal with very deep fades and very, very weak signal paths. And I think that they're getting down to within a few dB of the thermal noise floor at HF frequencies by doing this. And this was actually created as a bit of an equalization for people who didn't want to go buy 100-foot towers and put up huge antennas, but still wanted to be able to com communicate over long distances. The noise floor of this is so low because the effective bandwidth of that coding is so narrow that you actually can detect things with very, very modest equipment. They're trying to talk to each other. They're, 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 yeah, ultimately this is making contacts, okay? But, but you can transmit very, very limited amount of information because of the redundancy in the code that keeps sending the same thing over and over again. So it's pretty much, are you there? Yeah, I'm there. I'm here. You're here. See ya. That's pretty much what we're doing. But on the other hand, people have done, people have gone long path around the world the wrong way, Australia. I've done a little bit of that from a wire that I hung in my backyard. You know, it doesn't take much. All of that was done by the, the, by the appearance of software radios and um, sort of the, the ease in which one could install them and use them. So this is the future, folks. This is, this is where it's at. Um, pretty soon we will walk the ADD converter in an affordable way, we're already doing that professionally, all the way back to the transducer so that all you will have in your analog setup is an antenna, a low noise amplifier, and an ADC. and Everything else will happen digitally. Um, we're already doing that professionally, but it, this is even going down to the point where, um, you know, normal you and I can go buy this stuff on eBay and do it. And my colleague Frank Lind will be talking about that. One other thing that also happens is that sometimes you actually, a, a link is really weak, okay? You've brought as much transmitter power as you can, you put as large an antenna as you have, and that, that, that link is still really, really weak. Well, you can play this game called pulse compression, which means that I modulate the signal I'd like with a code that I know what was, it was on the other end. And if I use that code to demodulate the signal on the other end, the signal and the noise tend to separate themselves because the noise isn't modulating in a code that I put out. And so I can achieve essentially what is energy compression. I can actually take the amount of energy I would put in a long pulse and instead stuff it all into something that is equivalent of a larger system. And so the cell phone network and the Wi-Fi standard running through this room use that kind of thing. For example, because if you're driving your car, it would be nice not to have to be dragging around a 20 meter antenna behind your car if you want to talk to the GPS satellites to find out where you are. The GPS satellites, in fact, use heavy amounts of coding. So you can have a really small, cruddy antenna on your end and still pick up the signal. That's pulse compression, and Joel Dawson will be talking about that in one of the later lectures. I will point out that that also happens in nature. This is a rotating radio star. This is Pulsar PSRB0959-154, which rotates at a rate rapid enough that you get a pulsed signal every fraction of a second at about 1.668 gigahertz. There it is, ping, 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 ping. This is from the Park 64 meter telescope in Australia. If I were to play this audio, it's not a tone. It actually drops very slightly. If you listen to it over and over, you could hear that the tone starts at a higher frequency and drops a little bit until the, the rotating neutron star beam has gone by us. That is a signature of the interstellar medium between us and the star because that actually takes the longer, the lower frequencies and delays them longer than the higher ones. That's information. That's actually a form of natural pulse compression. Finally, two or three slides just on radio science. What can I do with this in terms of a remote sensing tool? You can do things like help discover the radiation belts. This is Explorer 1, which if you read the early uh, history of the US Space Launch Program, was the first uh, scientific satellite up in 1958. And James Van Allen in this picture right here, and here he is holding it up with Werner von Braun over here. Um, 
That had a transmitter on board that had four very simple telemetry streams. They were frequency shift keying. You can see them right there. And they were deliberately designed so that an amateur with a VHF radio could tune them in. And so this guy, Roy Welch, in Dallas put an antenna up and pointed where the satellite was. And on February 11th, 1958, let's see if this works. It does not. Ah! In any, in any case, it just sounds like that warbling sound that you heard when I tuned in that particular thing. That's one of those things. The cosmic ray counter is why this guy ended up discovering the radiation belts. That there was all this radiation in near space that he had never learned. It was all done using a radio link. Um, by the way, Alan Rogers, who will be talking in, later on radio astronomy, is the son of this fellow named John Rogers, who was Van Allen's chief uh, tech, uh, engineer in Iowa. So another good reason to come see Alan's talk. You can also de determine what happens to the ionosphere, for example, when you bounce radio waves off, off it, and something like a huge eclipse goes by. Anybody here see the August 21st eclipse? Few, few of you maybe. Some, there were huge NASA webcasts, I remember. We actually turned our ionospheric radar system, and I'll talk a little bit about that in, in my lecture uh, in a few days, and we actually just measured sort of the remote, the ionospheric electron density as a function of altitude and time on a day there wasn't an eclipse and a day there was an eclipse. Can you find the eclipse? <laughs> right there. This, this antenna was looking a thousand kilometers away from where the eclipse shadow was. But the eclipse has an edge, and the edge causes a huge reduction in the amount of electrons in the upper atmosphere. All of that is done using radio waves. Um, and in fact, this is a really, really hard experiment to do. Um, I use my two megawatt transmitters, and I get about two femtowatts back. Um, even with a large antenna, requires some care, but if you do that, you can actually do remote sensing. My colleague Anthea Koster will also talk about space weather a little bit later in this series. And then finally, you can go beyond the planet to look at things like black holes. There's something called the Event Horizon Telescope, which is an international consortium, which is looking at Sagittarius A star, which is the closest black hole to us. It's a, a black hole of about four million solar masses, um, a reasonably compact object. And the idea is to put a bunch of telescopes that span the planet together and to, and to basically phase them all up as one coherent telescope to look at the details of the black hole. That's something called very long baseline interferometry. And this is the simulation of what it should look like. This is the environment around the black hole, which is a messy eater, as my colleagues tell me. Um, material falls in, and at some point it goes beyond the short trial radii and it never comes back. This telescope should be able to probe that structure down to about five short trial radii, five times the radius where nothing comes back. At those points, general relativity breaks down. We don't know what matter does. This is the best guess, or one of them. Is that right? Does general relativity contain errors in that extreme environment? Probably. Radio waves is really the only way to probe that structure, but you do need a planet-sized observing network, but people are doing that. And Alan will talk a little bit about that in his lecture a little bit later. So, just to conclude, this is really what I wanted to point out, is that radio has been developed for more than a century. We're just getting started. It is everywhere. It permeates all of modern life. It perme and, and, and there's an enormous amount of remote sensing that happens. It really is essential to communicate over unthinkable distances any way else. It's still frontier science. We're still learning things that we did not know. And it's kind of fun. So it's nice of you to let me introduce you to this particular subject. Um, I'm looking forward to the rest of the uh, lectures in the series. I hope you are too. And I'm also extremely grateful that you didn't eat the pizza before this point. <laughs> <laughs> so, thanks very much. I can take a question or two here, or we could just have questions since people are having food. And I'll give a quick advertisement for tomorrow. Ah. Quick advertisement. Go ahead. Quick questions for her, please. Oh, yes. Anybody? Yeah. Oh, somewhere. Go ahead. Um, 
I, I wanted to go back to just some of the fundamental um, propagation. And you didn't say very much about dispersion effects. No, I did not so hear. I mean, they're, I mean, they're obviously, I'll there must be gradients in the dispersion. Obviously, uh, uh, zero, uh, epsilon zero, and uh, uh, u zero are, are not what they would be in you know, absolutely perfect vacuum. Right. Nothing on the charge unit. So, do you see these effects? Do people follow them? Do you know, they're important? Do you get information? There are people who study, like, um, there are people who study scattering in the interstellar medium, for example. Um, there are people who also do, uh, for example, even within, within the solar system, for example, in the space between planets, people do interplanetary scintillation. We have a block of plasma that comes along. It's going to, for example, not let the perfect vacuum field continue along. Um, there are people who study that, again, as a remote sensing tool. For the people who go beyond that, um, a better question probably to ask my radio astronomy colleagues. Um, at some point you have to make a lot of assumptions about what's going on. Um, usually I stop at those assumptions, so I'm just trying to say that I haven't had personal experience dealing with those sorts of effects. But anywhere there is a charge and there's not a vacuum, you have to have at least at some level some effect. Because if you think about it, as the radio wave is going by, it's accelerating that charge, right? It has to. So some amount of wave uh, energy has to come out of the wave. Um, I mean, that's the principle behind Thomson scattering. You have these little Hertzian dipoles. Every electron sucks a little bit out of the wave and transmits a little bit of, little bit of energy back itself. So there is some. At some point, um, if the interstellar distances get too long, then you have to start worrying about that. But that's about as much as I want to say about it. But you're also a gravitational lensing. And then there's, there's uh, right, and that, that, that black hole is an absolutely extreme example of where the reason that you saw this particular structure around the hole, and in fact that it's Doppler boosted on this side, there's more emission here than they are here, is because of some of the lensing that's occurring in the extreme environment around the black hole. You can model that with things like multi hydrodynamic um, quasi-fluid things, but it gets hairy in a, in, a, in a hurry, but there has to be lensing occurring right over here. It, it's just, it's, it's fundamental to the environment around the hole. The part of the event horizon project is to determine how far out that lensing extends, for example. Um, and that should tell you a lot about the parameters that are, that are in there that are measuring where the lensing is getting um, uh, uh, big enough to distort your view. Other question? Okay, advertisement. I'll say a word. I'm David Kasdan. I'd like you to meet my colleagues Nathaniel Vishner and Christina Collins. We're here from Cleveland, Ohio, which is a small foreign city west of here. Um, we are Case Western Reserve University's Amateur Radio Club. We will be speaking tomorrow on modulation techniques. For those of you who are relatively new to electrical engineering, We'll be showing off a couple of the fundamental amplitude and angle modulation techniques in each of time domain, frequency domain, and phaser domain. I think it's an interesting illustration. We'll talk about some other things as well. And I will say what I trust is the motto of this lecture series, which is every engineer should have an amateur radio license. What do you guys want to do for? <laughs> <laughs> So that was thanks. unprompted. And thanks for all of this. this <laughs> that was unprompted. <laughs> okay, uh, Daniel, what's the uh, what's the procedure? Well, I, I guess thank you all for coming. If you're interested in all this stuff, certainly come back for the rest of the lectures. And also, MIT does have an amateur radio club. We have resources and do a lot of that. This and. If you actually want resources to start playing with radio, SDRs, even EME, uh, bouncing signals, oh, yeah, like yeah. you talked about, we are building systems to do that currently on the green building. And if you're interested in playing with any of that, come find us. Thank you. Oh, someone else raise your hand. Being, these are being live streamed for the entire mm -hmm. month? Yes, that's the plan. And what is one to actually figure out what the link is to find the live stream? 
Um, the ARL posted a thing. I don't believe it's on the IAP site yet. We will fix that. It's not on the IAP okay. site. Okay. It will also be put up on the W1MX website, which you can find just by Googling us. It's in the email as well. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, the link is in the email. And I take it that once the live stream is over, the link just, the, 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 the video just stays there so that people it can go. It should. Okay. Obviously, this is the first time we've done this, so. Crush your fingers. <laughs> and we can test that Great. right now. There's food over there.